Okay, it's recording. It's recording. All right. Turn it over to you guys. All right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rachel Lindsay. I'm Brittany Edwards. And I'm Mike Bender. And uh, we did our brief presentation on ethics and code of conduct within law enforcement. And specifically, we're going to be talking about police code of ethics. And just we're going to give a little brief background of what we're going to go over and then just give you guys to just start the conversation just some facts and basic information about police officers and policing. Um, so for an overview of our presentation, we're going to start with just talking about the fundamental duties of law enforcement and, you know, policing and the, num you know, the number of policemen within a county or within a city. Um, and then we're going to go into detail about the two different types of structures that started out when we talk about code of ethics. The first is the Metropolitan Police Act. And the second is what we're really going to focus on, which is within the United States, the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And after that, we're going to talk about IACP and really, you know, who they serve, how ethics is upheld. And it's a little different <coughs> from prior presentations because with law enforcement, there isn't actually a universal code of ethics, and we'll get into why that is. Um, but rather, there's an oath of honor that all officers take. And we're going to talk about how that relates to ethics and how we, you know, can see that in the course. Um, and a really essential part of our conversation is going to be talking about the challenges um, to the police code of ethics, just because of, you know, the impact that the public has on maintaining um, their duties. And then we are going to talk about why ethics matters in law enforcement, and we'll move it over to class discussion. Okay, so just a little background on the fundamental duties of law enforcement um, to serve the community, to safeguard our lives and property, protect the innocent, keep us safe, and really ensure that you know everybody has a right to life, liberty, and justice. And this kind of goes back to even what we were just talking about today. You know, we impose certain certain obligations on police officers and we expect certain things from them. And so that's just a little bit of the fundamental duties. Um, what do police have the power to do? They have the power to arrest. They have the power to use force. Sometimes they have the power and decision between life and death. Um, but most importantly, they have the power to protect us. And I think a lot of us look to the police as a, as a universal sign of protection. And um, that's really important when it comes to thinking about their code of ethics and how do they protect us while also making sure that they're doing it responsibly. So the first known, can't say for a fact, but the first known real code of ethics um, was started in 1829 by a Sir Robert Peel, and that started in the Metropolitan Police Force in London. Um, and the directives that came from uh, Sir Robert Peel were known as the Pillian Principles, and they still guide modern law enforcement today in democratic societies not in the U.S., and we'll get into why, um, but the Pillian Principles are, there are nine of them. I'm not going to go through all of them, but what I can tell you is they're really kind of what we already talked about with the fundamental duties. It's to prevent crime and disorder, to serve and protect the community, um, to only use physical force when necessary, and one of the biggest ones, which is number seven, is to maintain a relationship with the public, that the police are the public, and vice versa. And this is, again, what Cooper's talked about in the book about that responsibility of, you know, you have an administrative responsibility to carry out your duty, but at the end of the day, you're also a citizen. You're also the person that you're protecting. Um, and all of the nine guiding principles are there. So the main focus that we're going to be talking about today is the IACP, which is, again, the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And that is the major organization within the United States that regulates what, what can be considered the code of ethics. Um, they started in 1893 within Chicago, Illinois. And um, today it's run in more than 100 countries. Um, but IACP didn't start out as an organization that was looking to create a code of ethics. They were really, their mission originally was to just apprehend fugitives and basically return them to other agencies. So you can look at that as they were doing part of their ethical duty in you know, 
keeping the public safe and you know protecting protecting individuals. But the first code of ethics, because they didn't you know form as an ethical institution to figure out these are a code of ethics, it wasn't until 1957 that they actually you know wrote down the code of ethics, and it wasn't revised until 1989. to the oath that police officers have to take before they actually um, be going to the line of duty. Um, I'm just going to read the first three couple of lines um, because you guys can have it in front of you. Um, like I said, this is just the oath that they have to take. Um, on my honor, I will never betray my badge, my integrity, my character, or the public's trust. Um, this is something that's very important because as a police officer, you definitely want to make sure that you do have the integrity as well as you are protected. Um, the community. All right, so um, another thing is the Richmond Police um, Department, um, they also, they definitely have a code of ethics that they have to abide by. Um, the first one I'm going to read is, as a law enforcement officer, my fundamental duty is to serve mankind, to safeguard lives and property, to protect the innocent against deception, the weak and oppression or intimidation and the peaceful against violence or disorder and to respect the constitutional rights of all men to liberty, equal, and justice. So that's something that we definitely um, were discussing in class. We definitely want to make sure that, um, well, this particular organization is definitely making sure that they are producing police officers who do have um, these particular ethics, you know, when going out into the community. And these are some other ethics that they do have um, as well that we did highlight um, within the um, I'm not going to read through all of them because, you know, we take up too much time. So, um, I definitely um, suggest that you guys look at it because it is great. All right, so now we're going to look at the mission, values, um, and vision um, of IACP. So, the mission is dedicated to advancing and promoting the law enforcement <coughs> profession and protecting the safety of law enforcement officers. Um, the vision of this particular organization is to serve the leaders of today and develop the leaders of tomorrow. And the values um, of this particular organization is professional um, integrity, accountability, sustained commitment to quality work and service, striving to be progressive, and preserving and cultivating mutually beneficial partnerships. All right, so this particular organization, um, as Rachel said, it's not an organization for pretty much those who aren't law enforcement officers, but it's pretty much geared towards commissioners, superintendents, chiefs, directors, assistant, and deputy chiefs of police. So like I said, there's no outside people who can pretty much join the organization. We're just looking at law enforcement officers. Um, associate members, um, those members involved in practicing or teaching law enforcement and security classes. All right, so in this particular um, section, um, so pretty much um, the ISCP, they have a strategic planning approach. Um, so particularly with well, this particular um, approach, it's a comprehensive plan. And it's an effort um, led by um, ACP's Board of Officers and Professional Staff. And it reflects the perspectives of all levels of organization and it, slept in, and it sets a clear direction for years ahead. Um, so it's pretty much to progressively move on, I mean, move towards um, pretty much making sure the organization is fulfilling all of the duties and making sure they pretty much keep it up, you know, with the time. In order to do this, they look at the future state, um, they identify and prioritize um, focus areas, develop and implement action plans, and monitor and manage the effectiveness to make sure that the um, organization is progressing. All right, so the strategic goals um, um, of that ISCP, I'm sorry, um, looks um, at is the membership services, international presence, training and leadership development. Um, they serve as a voice for policing issues, partnerships, and organizational excellence. All right, so for membership services, um, we're not going to go through all of the goals. Um, we're only going to go through um, a couple of them. But the ones I chose were um, membership um, services, um, 
I also looked at training and the, um, leadership development for police officers, as well as um, they serving as the voice of police and issues. So for the leadership <coughs> service um, portion, um, it's for law enforcement and policing. Um, well, we have to understand that the law enforcement and policing environment is very um, complex. Um, the items that were once national is issues, including terrorism and immigration, must be dealt with at a local level. And IAP, IACP wants to find a balance between membership and um, the needs um, needs and core um, IACP functions for success. Um, and also in this particular um, goal, they want to provide a high quality and innovative membership services to ensure membership um, satisfaction. All right, so training and leadership development. Um, so for this particular um, one, um, they want to, um, through mentoring and training, the ICP wants to develop capable and ethical um, leaders. They want police chiefs, commanders, specialists, and a lot of um, off duty officers to stay abreast and gain control of the key issues facing um, law enforcement issues. And through online and classroom opportunities, the IACP will ensure that members have access to top tier training. So that's definitely one of um, the biggest aspects of this. They're making sure that they're training um, law enforcement officers to actually be able to go out into the field and be able to handle certain issues and making sure they're equipped um, with those issues that they're dealing with on a daily basis. And the last one is to serve as the voice of police and issues. Um, ICP's role as a voice within the community is to promote dialogue, research, and debate. Um, ICP does not always seek to develop a consensus, rather often plays a vocalizing of key issues and facing the policing community as a way to inform and advocate. So the main purpose um, is to make sure that they are actually dealing with these issues and they are a voice for those within the community. So in order to do this, like I said, they're making sure they're training their officers, they're making sure they're um, actually bringing in quality um, actual officers within the policing profession, and like I said, they're making sure that they're a voice for the community, and making sure that, you know, things are getting taken care of, and... Um, I'm going to go over some really quickly some uh, common things along with both the uh, Helium principles, the IACP, and the Oath of uh, Honor. Um, you talk about the first part of it is the responsibility for the job. Well, those are basically placed in statutory requirements. You know, that we give we as law enforcement are given those responsibilities by legislatures, legislative bodies who have decided um, that we need to. Uh, to the role of law enforcement for that community. Um, you know, we, we talk about the performance of duties uh, impartially. We train constantly on impartial policing um, and, and taking ourselves, we talked about earlier, taking yourself out of that uh, personal feelings and, and doing just what the code says and, and following just that. Um, one of the other big issues or, or parts of it is the police use of discretion. Um, this is the one we were talking about that, that led back to the readings with uh, Frederick. He would approve of that because you know you are allowed as a, a public administrator to use some discretion to still move forward and get the job done. Um, the use of force, you know, that we are supposed to use force only the amount necessary to affect the arrest and no more. Um, and what you guys or what people tell law enforcement is supposed to be confidential in nature. Um, what we know about, we're not supposed to talk about. Um, next slide. Common themes, uh, and continue to talk about integrity uh, and, and adherence basically to moral and ethical codes. You, know, you have to have integrity in law enforcement, um, otherwise enforcing laws, is there's no point in it because you're expected to adhere to those laws, you're expected to abide by those in the rules of the department. Um, the next two uh, basically come down to professionalism. Law enforcement officers need to be professional. They need to continue their development throughout their career. Um, that's one of the reasons that I'm still here, is I'm continuing to try to progress even in the later stages of my career because I think it's important. Um, 
you know, you look at the last one, private life. Uh, one of the, the, the number one the word that comes to my mind in that is unsolved. You know, you, you have to live a life that you would expect if anybody looked at it that they wouldn't go, oh my gosh, that person is doing something like that at home. Um, because what you do at home and what you do in the uniform, <coughs> if not, people see it as the same. So, next slide. Um, one of the big challenges to uh, the police code of ethics in any organization, and not just with the IACP, is how often is it reviewed? How often, we, you know, we talked about it earlier, is with the, with the code of ethics, who looks at it? Who decides that it needs to be changed, it needs to be tweaked? Um, we've talked about how the changing landscape for uh, public administrators, not only you know, here, but all throughout the country, and for that matter, all throughout modern um, democratic societies is, is the same. It's constantly evolving, it's constantly changing, but yet we're still going about using the code of ethics that was first written in 1957, was uh, rewritten again in 1989. The same code of ethics that the Richmond Police Department uses, the same one I recited 20 years ago. So 